Discovery Channel. Viking is one of the Navy's most versatile aircraft. From searching out enemy submarines to dropping bombs and torpedoes, the Viking has truly earned its place on board the carrier. Along the way, it has redefined the role of the scout. United States, Operation Desert Storm was the largest military effort since the Vietnam War. Thank you, Bill. You run anybody right now? Throughout the war, infrared video provided the world with an ominous image of what is meant by air superiority. of the conflict, over 1,000 sorties were flown by coalition airplanes. A quarter of these were flown off the decks of the Navy's six carriers in the region. Much of the naval thunder was provided by the F-18 Hornet and this, the A-6 Intruder. minutes of the war, Air Force strikes had neutralized the Iraqi fire control and radar tracking stations. Attacking planes now had the luxury of flying undetected through a radar-free corridor. Clear, or forward-looking, infrared sensors allowed attacking pilots to target weak spots. Coupled with laser targeting, coalition pilots had the uncanny ability to fire into an air conditioner vent from miles away. During the Gulf War, the ever-changing tactical picture meant that Navy squadrons had to be flexible. Targets like tanks and mobile scud bunkers were constantly moving. After finding the target, the pilot then needed to locate the ever-moving aircraft carrier. With the air war constantly evolving, the Lockheed S-3 Viking would see a wider variety of roles and missions than any other plane in the Navy. This is Cecil Field Naval Air Station in northern Florida. A squadron of naval aviators have been residing at this Jacksonville Air Base for the past six months. In just a week, they will be going to their ship. This plane belongs to Sea Control Squadron 31. This squadron is known as the Top Cats. For the Top Cats, Six months at home, six months on the ship, is a familiar cycle. When it comes time to leave, the stability of life on land is uprooted by the uncertainty of a carrier deployment. A deployment which at any moment can be disrupted and diverted by a conflict in a distant land. In the austere fiscal environment of the 90s, much of the military hardware developed during the Cold War is rapidly becoming obsolete. In an effort to downsize, the Navy has needed to reduce the variety of aircraft deployed aboard the carrier. Airplanes with specialized missions are being replaced by those whose capabilities are numerous and varied. The Lockheed S-3 Viking is one of the planes likely to maintain a presence aboard U.S. carriers into the next century. Initially designed to fly against the Soviet fleet, the Viking has evolved into arguably the most versatile aircraft in the Navy. In 
the final week before the carrier deployment, the top cats must complete their last phase of workups. The workup cycle is an extensive series of training exercises designed to prepare an entire air wing for any challenges they will encounter during the six-month cruise. For the top cats of Sea Control Squadron 31, this wide array of training exercises reflects the versatility of their plane. One day it may be surface recon. The next may be anti-submarine warfare. With the addition of a buddy refueling store, the top cats are equipped to provide aerial refueling. With a stable airframe, a variety of avionics, and passive radar sensors, the Viking is now used in the sophisticated game of electronic warfare. From countermeasures to electronic intelligence, Viking crews are well adapted at reading the enemy. However, today's mission is an old-fashioned one. Dropping bombs. Castle Naval Bombing Range, 120 miles south of Jacksonville, the top cats hone their attack skills. The Viking was not initially designed to bomb tanks. However, its intended role in seeking out enemy vessels on or below the surface of the ocean means that it can dive rapidly. So uh, the S-3 is capable of, of descending from around 30,000 feet right down to the surface in less than two minutes. Uh, we don't have very much of a rate of climb, uh, but we can come down here pretty quickly. And, and in fact, the pilot has to really be careful not to overspeed the aircraft on the descent and, and go through our 450 knot limit. Viking can be equipped with air-to-ground rockets, allowing the pilot to simply aim and shoot. Although the naval strike mission is usually associated with the aging A-6 intruder or the sleek F-18 Hornet, the Viking is well equipped for this role. Aside from rockets, anti-shipping mines and torpedoes can also be unleashed by the Viking. However, it is the addition of a long-range harpoon missile that gives the Viking its teeth. Synthetic Aperture Radar, or ISAR. Because ISAR reads only the motion of a given target, it can provide an image of that target. This image will then be automatically cross-referenced within the system's tactical library. If the ship is deemed hostile, the harpoon may be sent on its way. targets far away from the fleet and if necessary destroy them the viking has become the modern equivalent of the scout bombers of the 1930s however like the early scouts the viking crews have one problem they cannot defend themselves the absence of air-to-air -air weaponry is not really life-threatening when considering that enemy fighters would first need to deal with the tomcats and hornets providing the air cover but in any case, the Viking was designed to be very maneuverable. If an enemy fighter attacks, the pilot's only defense is agility. In reality, the most serious threat comes from anti-aircraft artillery and surface-to-air missiles. 
chaff and flares are deployed to confuse the enemy's fire control radar and missile guidance system. At this point, the primary mission switches from strike to survival. station in Cecil Field, the men and women of the sea control community are charged with keeping pace of the ever-expanding role of their plane. Commander Bruce Bowl is a veteran S-3 pilot who has seen his plane adapt to the changes brought about by the end of the Cold War. This is the S-3B Sea Strike Viking. Some of the features include the jet, the magnetic anomaly detection gear for submarine detection. We've also got the arresting hook which traps aboard one of uh, four wires, hopefully. The aircraft also has approximately 60 sonoboy chutes designed to drop both active and passive sonoboys to look for nuclear and diesel submarines. For our own protection, we've got electronic countermeasure dispenser used to dispense both chaff and flares for us to avoid surface-to-air missiles. The airplane was designed in the early 70s, and what they did is they used LTV's landing gear from the old A7, uh, a proven carrier landing gear. Uh, so far, we've had uh, no problems at all with this. It's stressed over two to three times that of a normal landing gear. The aircraft was also designed with a high wing, which gives it excellent water capabilities. The large flaps you see help decrease the approach speed of the carrier at night, which really helps out a lot. Our electronic countermeasures pod will detect all hostile radars within 360 degrees. Our bomb bays and our bomb rack give us the ability to drop Mark 80 series bombs, torpedoes, mines, harpoon, and anything else we can hang on the rack. Just like any commercial airliner, the pod here is stressed to withstand any G-forces, any turbulence. The pod itself can move out, in fact, it can move up to 11 inches uh, right above the axis. This is a GE turbofan TF-34. Over 85% of the thrust is by the blades and not by the jet engine. Each one of the blades is milled separately. In fact, the uh, trademark Hoover sound that you hear is the velocity of the air at, at different speeds passing through these blades. B is probably the most versatile aircraft in the fleet today. If the battle group commander wants to go a long distance, detect, localize, and kill a hostile, it's the S-3B. When the United States Navy needs to go out and touch someone a long distance from the fleet, it's the Viking. In the late summer of 1990, the U.S. Navy was called upon. On August 2nd, 1990, the USS Independence was steaming across the Indian Ocean, and the USS Eisenhower was off the coast of Italy. When news came of the invasion, both carriers turned immediately towards Iraq. In only five days, they were poised to strike. In the crucial weeks that it took for coalition ground forces to dig in, naval air power was the primary deterrent. Before the January 15th UN-imposed deadline, Viking squadrons were heavily involved in the interdiction of any ships suspected of violating the trade embargo. At the onset of Desert Storm, Viking crews took on a more aggressive task. Electronic sensors aboard the Viking were immediately put to use in the role of electronic warfare. The ALR-76 can detect and identify targets without compromising the plane's location. This system also provided early warning of any threat posed by Iraqi air defenses. As the uh, SAM sites, the AAA sites came up online, the F-3 has an incredible ability to pinpoint the ESM, uh, the, the, the radar signatures. Uh, the airplane was primarily designed to find Soviet submarines. And with that, the Soviet radars, which are, which are extremely hard to find, we found that we, uh, we could see stuff on the ground. And the, the uh, strike commander was uh, very attuned to us coming up on a, on a net and saying, we have, uh, we have SAM site number one hot, we have SAM two hot, which actually changed the ingress and egress route of the strike airplane. South and east, more east of uh, Baghdad. Right on the river, the Tigers. An ever 
changing tactical picture means that Navy strikers are often forced to change their course and mission several times after leaving the ship. It is in this fast-paced combat environment that electronic warfare is vital. Both guiding an attacker into a target and getting him out safely. The Viking also played a crucial role in the refueling of strikers, especially on missions flown from the Red Sea. When the strikers went to downtown Baghdad, Viking pilots tapped fuel from tankers overhead. This allowed them to replenish the strike group again on the way out. We were there not only providing the ESM pitcher, but also providing that emergency gas that they may need. Uh, that's important because around the carrier, the KC-135s or the KC-10s can't get down in the carrier pa pattern and provide uh, uh, what we call recovery gas. In other words, a few trips around the carrier pattern and they need gas, we've got the ability to go down and grab them and uh, get them some gas when they need it. As the coalition forces pushed into Kuwait, they were greeted by black clouds from Kuwaiti oil fires. Departing Iraqis had set fire to more than 600 oil wells. Some 5 million gallons of oil per day were going up in flames. Uh, where I'm sitting here, we're at 23,000. Off the left, uh, there's another giant uh, oil field on fire. I can sit and count at least 40 dots in that that are on fire. Using infrared sensors, Viking crews deployed from the USS Ranger witnessed the setting of the first oil fire. From then on, Viking squadrons were called upon to maintain round-the-clock surveillance of oil fires throughout Kuwait. Individual oil fires on that one. Throughout the invasion, Viking squadrons increasingly flew overland missions. One of their more unique, if not dangerous, missions involved a system called the Tactical Air Launch Decoy, or TALD. These decoys draw the attention of surface-to-air missiles. When the SAMs have been expended on the decoys, the strikers follow close behind. Altitude. Altitude. During the Gulf War, Viking crews were ordered on strike missions for the first time ever. Iraqi naval bases, naval support facilities, and silkworm missile sites were on the hit list. In the later stages, these missions grew to include strikes against enemy airfields, railroad yards, ammo dumps, and SAM sites. Using inverse synthetic aperture radar, Viking crews were charged with seeking out any remaining Iraqi boats. Commander Bruce Bowl remembers his most eventful mission. On the 20th of February, I was flying an armed surface reconnaissance flight in the North Gulf. Uh, through our inverse synthetic aperture radar, about five miles from Flock Island, we picked up a high-speed uh, Iraqi patrol boat. It looked like it was heading towards Iran. Uh, we normally are not charged with uh, any surface warfare, but this time the A6 uh, above me didn't have a visual. We called, got clearance to drop, uh, put the airplane in an extremely steep dive, dropped uh, three Mark 82 bombs. Uh, unfortunately, the refueling store went with it. Two hours later, a direct hit was confirmed by the Navy. This was significant to us because it was the first time that a ASW platform since World War II had, had engaged and uh, destroyed a surface contact. The uh, carrier group commander was thrilled with the event. My squadron skipper wasn't thrilled because I'd lost the refueling store. But uh, all in all, it was a good day. Back at Cecil Field, the top cats of Sea Control Squadron 31 had completed their final phase of workup. For the last six months, they have spent most of their time here in Jacksonville. It's time to go back to the ship. Somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, a carrier awaits. This is the USS George Washington, the newest of the Navy's 14 carriers. In the summer of 1994, as these young deck handlers were still coming to terms with their new vocation, the George Washington was called upon to help ensure that Iraq did not again attempt to invade Kuwait. The four-acre flight deck appears to the layman as a vast area. 
In one sense, it is. Roughly the equivalent of an 80-story building floating on its side, the carrier is larger than any ocean liner. However, to the pilot who must land aboard it, the ship is less impressive. The first Viking catches the third wire. In a carrier landing, the third wire, or three wire, is the preferred landing. The first wire is dangerously close to the rear of the ship, and the fourth wire means that you are a little long. To catch a three wire on your first trap is a good way to begin any deployment. Occasionally, a pilot will miss all of the wires. This is referred to as a bolter. When a pilot bolters, he will need to re-enter the approach cycle and make another attempt. By late afternoon, the entire squadron has joined the air wing aboard the USS George Washington. Only one floor below the flight deck, top hats are already preparing for the next stage. Okay, today's uh, airplane is 704, call sign belong on 1004. If you load at 10,000 pounds of gas, we'll make the thrust weight about 43. For the carrier procedures, uh, launch and overhead time we've got the BRT final. For the next ground, six months, the, the men of Sea Control so Squadron first, 31 uh, will spend much of their time in this ready room. For some of them, this will be their first deployment. For some, it will be yet another. But for all, it is full of uncertainty. In the next six months, they will attempt to catch a wire on an airstrip that is pitching violently in massive waves and high winds. Hostilities may divert them to a distant corner of the world where anti-aircraft batteries and service-to-air missiles represent their greatest fear. Troubleshooting helped out uh, maintenance. Mel? Pressure off? Sir Brees? You're watching the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. Hi, Bob Vila here with an exciting new... little time to ponder what unseen challenges the next six months will hold. Right now, they must concentrate on CQ. CQ stands for Carrier Qualification. At the beginning of every deployment, the newly arrived air wing spends two days reacquainting themselves with the delicate art of being catapulted and, most importantly, landing aboard the ship. These early days of the deployment can also be the most challenging. Pilots fresh out of flight school will be put to the ultimate test, operational service. Many of the seasoned veterans will be working with new crew members. Good crew coordination is especially important aboard the Viking, which carries four airmen. Men and women who fly in the planes are not the only members of Sea Control Squadron 31. The trusted plane captains are already one level above, tending to the plane and ensuring that it is flyable. Working aboard a carrier deck is deemed by many as the most dangerous job in the world. Ever-moving planes crowd the deck in an ongoing traffic jam. Propellers and jet intakes are killer, and jet exhaust is notorious for blowing people into the water. During carrier qualifications, many of the deck handlers are on their first deployment. During these tense few days, it is vital for veteran flight deck personnel to keep a close eye on the newcomer. The beginning of this cycle of CQ is marked by the launch of an ES-3. This Viking variant uses passive sensors within its distinctive hump to gather electronic intelligence. 
The ES-3 circles around into an approach pattern. The tail hook has not been lowered, meaning that the pilot will be doing a touch and go. By now, two more Vikings have joined the cycle. All three planes will practice touch and goes before the landing cycle begins. The carrier landing is the acid test of naval aviation. The deck itself is at a 10 degree angle to the forward motion of the ship. Therefore, the Viking pilot needs to continually correct two degrees to the right before considering the multitude of other factors, like crosswinds and pitching of the ship. The landing signal officers will talk each pilot back to the ship. LSOs are veteran pilots familiar with the precision glide slope that needs to be maintained up to the point when hook meets wire. Each pilot's landing is recorded, then closely scrutinized. This is uh, pretty much how we keep track of all the pilots in the squadron. Right here we have all the, the names of the pilots, and uh, basically each, each marker here is a carrier landing. And uh, the colors symbol, uh, signify what uh, grade they got. For example, green would be an OK pass. Uh, yellow would be a fair pass. Red would mean a uh, no grade, which is a uh, 2.0 grade average. And, the, and then the uh, black would mean uh, a wave off. So this is a way to keep track of all the grades. And the pilots, it's pretty much a, also a thing that uh, gets competition going between all the pilots and the squadron. Basically, if they've got a whole line period up on here, the guy with the most green is doing the best, the guy with the most red is doing the worst. So, And we also have a system that we have in a computer that keeps track of uh, all the grades. So the grade point average is computed for every pilot. Lockheed Viking has assumed more roles and missions than any other Navy aircraft. In many ways, this modern-day scout represents a return to the very roots of naval aviation. When Orville Wright demonstrated a later version of the Wright Flyer, Navy Lieutenant George Sweet reported back, saying, The Navy must have that. It will be most important to us. With these words, the concept of naval aviation was born. The Navy's earliest efforts resulted in a plane that depended on the water as its airstream. From the air, the Navy could now see enemy ships and submarines from a great distance. If needed, the plane could even attack them. This form of naval aviation became known as scouting. In the early 20th century, Britain undoubtedly had the most powerful navy in the world. However, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm wasn't far behind. And as Europe spiraled into war, the naval race took a surprising turn. The powerful British Navy was quick to recognize the implications of air power. The result was the world's first true aircraft carrier, the Furious. However, the carrier was yet to make an impact. During World War I, the mighty battleship remained the king of the sea. In 1921, Brigadier General Billy Mitchell deployed his Army Air Corps bombers on a series of mock attack missions against captured German ships. The Army Air Corps reveled in its success. The Navy reminded the public that the target ships were sitting ducks. However, they were quietly enamored by the thought of carrying out such a strike themselves. The following year, the Navy got its wish. This is the United States' first carrier, the USS Langley. Curious onlookers called it the covered wagon. America's first tail hookers had few models in which to base their training. Such pioneering resulted in some precarious situations. Lieutenant Gerald Bogan would survive this crash and go on to lead a task force as a rear admiral in World War II. While the Langley Eaglets were still coming to terms with carrier landing, 
The desire to prevent another world war was still on the political front burner. At a Washington conference, the Allied governments agreed to reduce their naval power. The agreement required the U.S. to cancel two battle cruisers already under construction. However, the treaty permitted the construction of aircraft carriers. The canceled ships thus became the carriers Lexington and Saratoga. In the years to follow, five more carriers, the Enterprise, Wasp, Hornet, Yorktown, and Ranger, emerged from American shipyards. Attack carriers now consisted of four squadrons, fighters, dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and scouts. The scouts were responsible for seeking out and attacking enemy vessels well away from the fleet. In May of 1938, Navy pilots were launched from the Saratoga and Lexington. This was a training exercise. Their mission was to simulate a surprise attack against an American naval base. Scout bombers and torpedo planes concentrated on the shipyard. The fighters would repel their counterparts. The attacking planes took the Navy base by complete surprise. Resistance was non-existent, and by the rules of engagement, the carriers won the exercise. The victim was the Navy base at Pearl Harbor. Ironically, the lessons learned by this exercise were somehow remembered by the Japanese and forgotten by the Americans. Just three years later, Japanese carriers launched an attack in exactly the same manner. Pearl Harbor was again taken by complete surprise, but this time the attack was no simulation. In one day, the mighty Pacific fleet was brought to its knees. The U.S. was vaulted into war, a war in which the Navy's scouts would find a new role. were wreaking havoc on the Allied war effort. Millions of tons of shipping bound for Europe were lost to torpedo attacks. In an attempt to keep the vital flow of supplies free from the U-boat threat, merchant ships were escorted by a strong contingent of sub-hunters. The Scout became a sub-hunter. Escort carriers, or CBEs, were charged with anti-submarine warfare. The Grumman Avenger and its little brother, the Wildcat, worked together as hunter-killers. The more agile Wildcat would dive toward the submarine with guns and rockets blazing. When the submarine dove, the lumbering Avenger would unleash its depth charge. After World War II, the Soviets emerged with the largest submarine fleet in the world and growing. In the last three years of Stalin's leadership, well over 200 whiskey-class subs poured from Soviet shipyards. 35 of the enormous Zulu-class subs also emerged. Even if the Soviet submarines were not as impressive as they appeared, their sheer numbers posed a grave threat to the U.S. Navy. However, Soviet sub technology was impressive, and the outmoded hunter-killer pairs were beginning to lose their grip on this ongoing and most elusive war. With the pressure on, the Navy demanded a replacement that could defend the fleet from submarines while performing the role of both hunter and killer. The result was the Grumman S2 Tracker. Each tracker boasted a crew of four. Acoustic processing came in the form of sonoboys. The retractable magnetic anomaly detector, or mad boom, could pick up any variation in the Earth's magnetic field caused by a large metal object, such as a submarine. The tracker soon became the sole plane responsible for keeping Russian subs off the fleet. 
However, into the 60s, Russian subs were no longer the only threat. Under the leadership of Admiral Sergei Gorshkov, the size and firepower of the Soviet surface fleet had increased dramatically. Soviet Kira-class, Krivak-class destroyers poured from Black Sea port. Surface-to-air and anti-shipping cruisers equaled the capability of their Western counterparts. of Soviet naval buildup was highly visible. The U.S. Navy no longer sailed with impunity. In the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean especially, the seas were becoming very crowded. In the early 70s, U.S. naval aviation underwent a dramatic change. All naval aircraft were again consolidated into one air wing, much as they had been before World War II. Anti-submarine warfare was now brought into the fold. The 1960s had seen the emergence of an ever more daunting submarine threat. Attack subs like the Echo 2 class and later the Victor class submarines carried the firepower to devastate American warships. With its full complement of fighter, attack, electronic warfare, and anti-submarine aircraft, the American carrier was the primary target of the Soviet fleet. Complete with its 80-some aircraft and 5,000 sailors, the carrier is a city at sea. To the U.S. Navy, its loss would be unthinkable. By 1976, the Lockheed Viking was fully integrated into the fleet. Piston engine tracker had served during some of the most intense years of the Cold War, but was simply made obsolete by Soviet advancements. The jet-powered Viking was the logical follow-on. Like the tracker, the S-3A has four crew members working together in a coordinated effort to find and track enemy vessels. The pilot is not necessarily the mission commander. Naval flight officers, or NFOs, are responsible for keeping a finger on the pulse of the tactical situation. Our position as an NFO really is uh, in two different seats in the aircraft, both up front as a COTAC, which is a backup for the pilot's safety of flight, navigation, communications, weapon systems, and then an assistant uh, tactical coordinator. Also in the back seat, though, uh, is a tactical coordinator, and he's really in charge of the, uh, the whole tactical show. Whether it's ASW, ASUW, uh, electronic warfare, any of the different missions that we have, the tactical coordinators really run the show, talking to all the other uh, players outside of the aircraft, running the weapon systems, and uh, making all the tough decisions for the mission that have to be made. To maintain defensive combat readiness, the carrier air wing routinely carries out simulated attack exercises. Today, two American ships and one submarine will simulate an attack on the carrier. The air wing has no idea where the hostile vessels will be coming from. If the enemy vessels manage to close within striking distance, they will win the exercise, causing great embarrassment to the fleet commander and the entire air wing. At the beginning of the exercise, the Viking will lay a preliminary wall of sonoboys. The placement of each sonoboy is automatically entered into a computer, and its position is displayed on a screen in front of the tactical coordinator. The sensor operator, the Viking's only enlisted man, will process acoustic information picked up by the sonoboy. In separating the different noises, he will attempt to isolate the sound of the enemy. The cat and mouse game has begun.
returning to the inner zone, one of the Vikings spots something. It's a periscope. The submarine has somehow sneaked through the outer defense. Soon it will be within striking distance of the carrier. The race is on. The wing commander is notified, and an SH-3 Sea King is called upon to join the hunt. The helo now hurries to the spot where the submarine was last seen. Again, using the deep as protection, the submarine must now negotiate the labyrinth of sonobors. Far above, the Viking listens. The submarine lurks closer to the carrier. Its approximate location is determined. The time is running out. The Viking crew must now drop down to sea level in order to pinpoint the sub. At sea level, the magnetic anomaly detector, or MAD boom, is deployed. Working just like any metal detector, MAD responds when it passes over the large metal submarine. Mad man, mad man. reveals the presence of the submarine, all attention focuses on that location. A new layer of sonobuoys must now be laid between the sub and the carrier. The distinctive ping given off by the buoy alerts the sub that the air wing is on to it. Moving to areas of different water temperature may help block the sonar. However, with the arrival of the Sea King, it will be difficult for the submarine to continue evading the fleet. Now that the sub has moved through the wall of Sonoboy, the helo uses its dipping sonar to obtain a new signal. This new acoustic information is passed back to the tactical coordinator in the Viking. With this information, a tactical plot is created. Using a triangular fix, the TACO tightens the noose. As the submarine makes a desperate attempt to get out of the area, a smoke marker is dropped to show its last location. With both the Hilo and the Viking now on top of it, the massive submarine will have little chance of outmaneuvering its agile hunter. With its every move now being closely shadowed, the sub will now be attacked. During this simulated attack, the Viking deploys an underwater sound which alerts the submarine commander that he is under siege. The air wing has defeated the elusive hostiles. By the rules of the game, the sub must surface and remove itself from the exercise. Fortunately, during the Cold War and to this day, the only attacks against the fleet were training exercises like these. Like the early scout bombers of the 1930s, Viking squadrons are now responsible for a variety of roles. With added teeth and advanced electronic sensors, the S-3B can effectively monitor and defend the outer limits. The latest advance, called Outlaw Viking, will provide over-the-horizon targeting and electronic intelligence that can be transmitted to battle commanders anywhere in the world via a data link system. With the S-3B and now Outlaw Viking, Naval scouting has come full circle. For almost 30 years, uh, the predecessor of this airplane was primarily an ASW platform. Uh, recently, probably in the last five or six years, the F-3B has taken us way beyond that and in some ways has taken us right back to the evolution of the airplane in the beginning of scouting. Back on the USS George Washington, our Viking squadron is preparing to return home. In the past six months, these airmen have helped to enforce trade embargoes in both the Caribbean and the Mediterranean. They have skirted the border of Iraq collecting electronic intelligence, and they have trapped a wire in 60-foot waves in the North Sea. 
short strip at Cecil Field is a welcome sight. And as the tired squadron returns, another prepares to leave. Coming up next, will the whip...